Hi guys, welcome back to Ox Tools. I'm Tom. Um, tonight we have a little uh, different kind of a video that we're shooting. Um, I have a long distance friend on the East Coast um, that's shopping for a lathe and um, he needs some help evaluating machine. So I figured this is actually a really good subject to shoot a video about because a lot of people um, want to get into metal work and want to have their own machinery and um, the used market is uh, an excellent place to find machinery um, but they're uncertain about how to evaluate a lathe, take a look at a lathe, see if uh, uh, they're buying a lemon or a, uh, uh, a dog or they're really getting a great deal. Um, so uh, the situation is that uh, this friend of mine is looking for a lathe and uh, um, um, so I've been helping him a little bit, kind of watching out in his neighborhood and um, his area of the country and we bumped into one that uh, that looks like looks promising so he's got an appointment to go down there and take a look at it and uh and kind of evaluate it and uh, and take and see if he's uh, it's going to be right for his needs so what i thought i would do um is just kind of go pretend this is a, a lay that we're the my lay here this yam uh, that we're evaluating and um, um, just kind of point out you know some of the things that are wrong with this machine and uh, and some of the things that uh, that you look for when you're going in and um, and checking out a machine and um, a lot of these are just kind of general uh, general things so we can get into some specifics each machine is a little bit different obviously uh, some machines are uh, you know have different shifting mechanisms and uh, and different accessories and things like that so obviously that's not in the in the scope of this discussion, but this should give folks a, uh, uh, a good kind of general idea of what to look for um, and look out for um, in, uh, when you're shopping for a used lathe. Um, so, in, you know, I'm going to try to zoom in on some of these things and, uh, and point out some of the stuff that we're talking about. And, uh, and I didn't really clean the machine up for this video or anything you know I generally keep it pretty uh, pretty neat you know not every day do I clean it but you get to a point where you need to clean stuff off and um, uh, so this might be how you would find a machine uh, that you visited a shop where they're using the machine and they want to sell it and, uh, and uh, you come in and it's all here for you it's just been running and, uh, uh, and you want to take a look at it okay so we're gonna go over this and uh, um, and um, shoot a shoot a nice video with this. I think this is going to be a good one. So, okay. So, the first thing I do is I just kind of look at the whole machine. Uh, and what's my first impression, right? I look at this machine, and uh, and what I see is I go, wow, the the paint's kind of chipped up, um, and um, you know it's a little bit it's a little dirty. There's stuff in the chip pan. I see that, um, but it's it's Whoever's using this machine, and I'm going to pretend I don't know, uh, <laughs> I don't know the character that's been using this, so we'll just uh, we'll just roll with that. Um, so I'm kind of looking at it here, and I'm going, well, it's not too dinged up, right? Other than the paint, but paints don't uh, don't let that hang you up too much. Uh, paint's not a big deal. Um, you can uh, it's easy to repaint stuff. What I worry about more is if somebody has repainted it themselves or say a used machinery guy has repainted it. So um, sometimes somebody might paint something to hide something. Uh, and if they don't do a good paint job, then uh, it's more trouble than a machine with, uh, with dinged up stock paint, okay? So when you paint these things, you wanna do a really nice job and get a nice smooth coating of paint and uh, so that they're easy to clean. And you don't wanna paint over crud. Uh, so a lot of guys, it takes a lot of effort to clean these things. Um, and uh, also, if it's got a fresh paint job on it, guess what? You're going to pay for that too. So somebody spent some time on it. So anyway, we're going to look at this thing. We look it over. Uh, it looks reasonable. You know, I'm looking at the, the levers. I don't see anything bent. Um, I don't see anything bent. You're going to try everything, right? Uh, see the things turn. Um, when you're rotating handles like this, I hope, let's see, let's run this down. You're looking for smooth rotation, no clunks or noises, things like that. This little handle's got a little chowder in it here, um, but the handle, the hand wheel, there's no run out, it's not bent. Same thing here. 
This is smooth, there's no tight spots. Um, we look at backlash here like this, back and forth. So we look and we look for backlash and we just kind of note how far we're moving here. Um, so a lot of backlash is not necessarily a bad thing. The screws and nuts for most lathes are readily available and re readily fixable. Some of them have uh, even uh, provisions for taking backlash out built into them. So um, don't get too hung up on that. Um, you know, 10 thousandths is a nice tight machine. You know, uh, you're getting into a full turn or something like that, then, uh, you know, the machine's seen a lot of work or, or, you know, it's seen a lot of use. So we're looking at this. I don't feel any tight spots and the handle's not, not lumping around. It hasn't been hit. A lot of these, when they get moved, the forklift bangs into this stuff here and bends it or, or messes it up. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Hey, it's got a nice tool post on it. That's a bonus right there. Hey, did that go with the lathe? That's an important question. Uh, so tooling can easily make up uh, a huge portion of, uh, of your opportunity costs there. Uh, if, if it doesn't have any tooling, the, the lathe's worth less. Um, if it does have a bunch of tooling, then uh, it's a good opportunity to, to tool up, okay? All right, so I'm going to change the camera around in a second. We'll get in a little closer. Um, the uh, let's see, what, well, let's back this up. So the, there's not a lot of backlash here, okay, which is good. This will have more backlash than the uh, than the cross feet, which is okay. It works on a rack and pinion. Uh, where these get messed up is you want to look at this rack underneath here, okay. And what you're looking for is uh, is teeth knocked off, okay. Um, another important thing, so the lathe get, gets used a lot in this position up here uh, towards the headstock, but it rarely gets run down there. So a lot of people really, they want to focus on the ways and what's going on with the ways, right? Well, ways are important, definitely, right? Uh, and one way to judge wear is see how the machine feels here and then run it all the way down to the end where nobody uses it down there, okay? And um, see if it feels the same, see if it feels tighter, see if it feels looser. Just kind of note uh, what's going on when you run it to the end that nobody uses it. Now, a lot of lathes are pretty small, so they see the, uh, uh, this is a pretty good size machine. Uh, the other thing I'm looking for is, you know, there's a little bit of oil on the ways, okay? So somebody's, uh, Somebody's taking care of this, or they're lubing the ways, and it's not cutting oil. It smells different, okay. Um, it's stickier. Um, if you put some between your fingers, you'll get little tendrils in between your fingers. Uh, that's whey oil, as opposed to cutting oil, okay. Um, and the other thing we want to do is, is run all the, we're going to run the apron all the way back and forth from one end to the other. You're going to run the the cross feed screw off as far as you can run it one way and as far as you can run it back this way. And the same thing with the, uh, the compound rest, okay? You're gonna run it all the way and you'll get a look, uh, you'll get a look in there at, uh, if it's full of chips or crud or rust or anything like that. So we don't see any signs of, uh, of heavy rust like it's been sitting outside. Uh, a lot of machines, you know, they sit in the corner of a shop so they get dusty. So if it's got, you know, a coating of dust on it that's stuck to the oil, not a big deal. It comes off with WD-40 and, uh, and cleans up real nice, okay? So uh, looking down at the foot brake, um, let's, let me check the camera there. Yeah, you guys can see that. Let me, uh, I'll tip it a little bit. So I'm looking at the foot brake here and uh, you can see the weld is, you know, this has been stepped on quite a few times. The paint's not worn off at the other end. Uh, once again, you're not using it down there, but it's worn off here. So this is, you know, it's seen some use, okay. Um, and then uh, we're looking at the, uh, um, the, the apron power screw and then the lead screw here. So what you wanna do with the lead screw, let me, uh, let me get in a little closer here. All right. So I'm going to be bumping this camera around here a little bit. So what we do with the lead screw is, um, the lead screw never gets used here, okay? The carriage just physically can't get to that point, all right? So 
whatever the screw looks like in this area here, very close to the headstock, this is what a brand new screw looks like, okay? So you can kind of compare this area here with um, the areas that are farther down. So maybe in this region here, two feet back, uh, you know, this is like, once again, this is a pretty big lathe, okay? So back in this region here is where you're gonna see, um, you're gonna see your wear areas on the, uh, on the lead screw. Now I just turned this, I noticed, uh, oh, hey, I can turn that by hand. Um, that's okay. Um, it probably means that this is disengaged. We'll get into the, uh, the headstock here in a second. Um, um, and these, uh, these drive screws here, so this one is for the, uh, um, the spindle start and stop. So that's just this lever right here. And then this is what provides power to the apron for the cross feed and the longitudinal feed. Um, see, oil. Um, so we're looking at that surface of the screw. Um, I can't turn this right now. Maybe I can kick it out, get it out of gear. Okay, well, we'll look at that. There's a keyway. You want to look at that keyway, make sure that that keyway is not all chowdered up. And, um, and so that's stuff to look for in this area here. Okay. Okay, so we're looking at the headstock here now. And once again, you know, you're noting that the, uh, the paint's pretty beat up on this. Um, this guy here, uh, this nameplate here with all the feeds on it, actually, personally, I wanna replace this. Um, it's a little hard to read. Um, so this is seen uh, oil and chips uh, rubbing across it. So this lathe has seen some, some, pretty, uh, some pretty good use. Um, and uh, so that's one indication of that. Um, when you look at the levers where somebody's hand uh, operates them, a lot of times the uh, name plates will be polished or worn uh, around switches. Uh, you see this a lot on CNC's, you know, where the, the button is. Um, you see a lot of wear along there. In fact, I've even seen the, the casing worn in a little bit from, uh, you know, rough calloused hands pressing those buttons so much. So it's an indicator of, of, of lots of use. So without running the machine, what we want to do is we want to come up here and we want to operate some of these levers and just see how they shift and how they behave and, uh, and see that they shift and that the detents feel okay um, and uh, nothing seems amiss. You'll have to turn the spindle for some of these. You can kick this one in neutral here. And when you kick the machine in neutral, I'm pretty sure, yeah, you can see that. Um, even on a big machine, you should be able to turn this freely by hand, okay? Um, this has got the collar closer on it, so we're in neutral here. In low range, obviously, it's gonna be hard to turn, um, so do your, do your checking while it's in, uh, well, in high range. And then you can try the levers. Okay, try shifting the levers. And you're just gonna try all of these levers and just see how they behave. Nothing feels funny or bent or broken. And uh, once again, I'm feeling, I'm feeling for these detents here. Okay, so my feed screw's turning now. All right, so that's just a quick evaluation. Uh, here's our speed chart on here. When we fire it up, we wanna fire it up and uh, when we get to that, we're going to fire it up in kind of a lower speed. You don't want to start up at, you know, 2,000 RPM or something like that. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too. Um, and um, so we can't, we're not going to, I'm not going to show you every single camera angle. You're going to look down the spindle hole, okay? Uh, you're going to take a look down there, see a, how dirty it looks for one. If it's clear, um, if you see anything amiss in there. Um, also, it's a, a good thing to measure just so you know what it is. Uh, big spindle holes are generally desirable as opposed to small spindle holes. Um, and uh, so you'll, you'll take a look at that. And once again, that's an easy thing to clean uh, when you need to clean it. Um, the other thing I'm looking for here uh, is oil uh, leaking out of any, around any of these levers. Okay, a little bit, no big deal typically. Um, but, you know, if there's a a moat of kitty litter around the machine that's probably a not not a good indicator um, and you know there's a five gallon jug of uh, of um, 
uh, spindle oil or machine oil next to the machine, uh, that's probably not a good indicator. Um, a lot of the oil leaks are easy to fix and a lot of them are not easy to fix. So that's uh, something to look out for. Um, and then um, if, there's any, if there's any sight glasses, now this one has a sight glass here. Uh, and it only shows oil when the thing's running. So, um, um, but if it has if it has sight glasses, look, you know, wipe them off a little bit and see if you can see oil in them. This is an indicator of how the the owner's treating the machine if they're if they're lubing it up, you know, uh, and they're taking care of business there. Um, can you see that? Yeah, I guess you can barely see that. So this is the uh, so this all seems to operate smoothly here. Okay, we're looking pretty good there. That one feels funny. Okay, well, it just doesn't move very far. Okay, all right. So that's just kind of the dry check on the uh, on the levers. Okay, and uh, now we're going to move to a different area. Okay, so this is the this is the way area up near the headstock here, and I'm just running my hands across it. I'm look I'm feeling for scoring and uh, anything funny or bumps. Um, and there's some little bumps, but they're not raised, okay? Um, you'll see here that the paint is worn off in this area. Not necessarily a bad thing. Um, over in this area, there's um, some of the, the stock finish there, so you know what it, what it used to look like. And then as we move farther away from the, the action area here, um, we, uh, you know, we see what the original paint looks like, okay? Um, so these are looking okay. Uh, this happens to be a gap bed machine, which is a removable center here. That's kind of a uh, desirable feature. Um, and I don't think this one's ever been out uh, looking at it. Um, and if it has, it hasn't been out very, uh, very much. Uh, they're a little, you gotta be a little bit careful putting them back in so that you get these, uh, get everything lined back up properly. It's got dowel pins and things like that, but there's some tricks to uh, kind of floating those in there and uh, and making sure that they're uh, back where they belong. Um, and um, okay, so next, let's see if I can. And I'll just move the camera. Okay, so here we got the uh, the uh, the apron, um, and then this is the cross slide here, and then this is the compound rest. Okay. So a lot of lathes show their age in this area. Um, this is an area that takes a little bit of abuse if you're not careful. Um, this corner right here this in particular is a real good indicator. Um, uh, <laughs> on a high school lathe, one that, uh, a lathe that's been in a school, uh, this corner will be just completely blown away uh, from hitting the chuck, uh, which is generally not a, not a cool thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, we're looking at the casting uh, of the cross slide here. Um, a lot of lays uh, have covers, uh, sheet metal covers on them here. They get pretty beat up. Uh, you'll be looking to make sure those covers are there. Um, now this has a, um, a, some alternate accessories that slide into this groove here. Um, and the groove's not, not beat up. It's got some little nicks in it, which is kind of normal, uh, normal wear and tear, but uh, nothing major going on there. Um, these are the the way wipers here and these are seem to be intact they're not missing uh, and then when we back the lathe up we see that it leaves a little trail of oil okay which means the thing's been seeing regular lubrication okay that's a good uh, a good indicator all right um let's see yeah let me uh what else what else on this um so when, when we fire the machine up, we're gonna try the cross feed and we're gonna try the longitudinal feed. That's a, a definite must on the, uh, on the testing. And um, um, all right, so tailstock. Um, tailstocks, um, lots of stuff can happen to tailstocks, okay? Um, so we're gonna run it back and forth. If it's got a, uh, if it's got something in the uh, in the spindle, we want to pull it out. Okay, uh, we want to put our finger in there and, and feel around. Okay, and we're feeling for any burrs or gouges. You can shine a light in there and take a look. Not a bad idea. Uh, you can examine the tool shanks to see uh, how they look. Uh, if that's uh, something that came out of there. Okay. Um, 
once again, you want to run the, these things to their extreme travels and see how they feel. Um, you know, you're pretty rarely out this far. Okay, so they're disengaged with the nut even, right? I could probably pull this out. I don't want to do it, but um, so you're looking at this surface here. You can feel it. Now use your hands, you know, on these things. You're going to get dirty, okay? And there's a keyway underneath on this one, so I'm feeling that. There's no notches there. So this is feeling pretty good. Okay, and then we're going to pull it back in. Okay, and then we're going to um, we're going to feel this uh, the locking mechanism, so I can feel it tightening up. Feels good. All right. Um, here, no hand wheel wobble. You know, smooth. No uh, tight spots as you rotate. Uh, those are the kinds of things you're looking for there. Um, and can you see this? Yeah. Okay. So here, these are offsetting screws. Uh, and I look at these offsetting screws and uh, I see some somebody's been in there with an Allen wrench monkeying around so what that means to me is they've twiddled this thing back and forth a little bit. Oh and uh, uh, the, the quill lock, you know, you want to check that. Make sure it's locking up firmly, okay, and releases smoothly. So that's a good one actually because, you know, you lock it, right, boom, it's locked. And when you, when you unlock it, does it actually unlock smoothly or does it bind and do you, you know, do you have to do some gyrations to get it to release, okay? Um, so, you know, that's about it. Uh, the little oil taps are still present there, okay, so it's all right. Once again, paint's a little beat up. People set a lot of things on top here, so the paints, um, well, ones that have a flat top, I should say. Um, you know, people set things up there, oil cans and crap like that, so, uh, a lot of times the paint's worn off on those. Some guys even make a little tray that goes up here, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's about it for tail stocks. All right, so we'll get that back out of the way. Let's put this in. Okay. All right, so we're looking a little closer here at the, uh, at the apron. And uh, so we're just, once again, we're just kind of dry trying these levers. And sometimes you'll have to, to joggle the... Uh, um, the uh, the hand wheel a little bit to get things to drop in. Uh, this is the threading lever here. Um, this should engage smoothly. Now you will have to move the hand wheel a little bit to get this to drop in. Okay, so it's got a detent. You can feel it. This particular lathe here, oh, there's a little oil coming off of that, um, has a uh, um, has the ability to. Uh, to kick the feed lever out, um, you know, with a stop that runs along the uh, um, the chip pan here. Okay, um, and then uh, let's see. Yeah, you can see that. Let me move over. So this is a uh, spindle engaged lever, and I'm just feeling the detents there. Everything feels pretty good. Uh, these, you know, you turn the lathe on and off a lot. So this is a high wear item here. Uh, once again, these are not too complicated, so you can usually take these apart and uh, uh, put new balls in it and new springs and, uh, and rework the detents a little bit and, uh, and make them feel nice and, uh, nice and crisp. Um, this particular lathe has a travel dial. I don't have a DRO yet, and uh, that'll be a future video installing a DRO on this. Um, so this is, this is a nice accessory here. Um, if you do nothing else with instrumentation on your on your lathe, uh, do this. This is a good one. You can pick these up on eBay and uh, Craigslist and stuff like that for reasonable prices, and then you'll need a bracket. But this keeps track of your uh, uh, your Z direction there uh, quite nicely. Um, okay. Okay. So this is the lower headstock area. And uh, this is an area, this is pretty important, um, depends on the complexity of the lathe. Um, the, uh, uh, but most lathes have a, uh, a motor starter, uh, forward and reverse circuit, uh, and there's usually a little bit of electrics, okay? So first impressions are important in this area. So you open the cover and you look and, and what's your first thought? And when I look in there, my first thought is, uh, it looks like somebody's been in there messing around. And you'd be right, because that would be me uh, doing a little bit in there. And uh, the previous owner uh, replaced a couple of these contactors here. Um, don't worry, you know, if you, if you don't know electricity, 
mainly what you're looking for is monkey business, okay? Uh, weird wires, uh, wires that aren't like, kind of like this, that aren't routed in a kind of a factory way. Um, looms um, that have been separated like somebody's doing some kind of diagnostics. If you see a whole bunch of uh, like spare parts in, uh, in this area, that's usually an indicator that somebody's been in there messing around. Uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, um, you know, boxes of fuses or dead fuses or something like that. Um, these are indicators that uh, uh, to ask some additional questions in that area. Not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, um, you want to at least ask the questions and see if the, the, the seller knows the answers uh, or knows what the history, what's going on there. Okay, so you know, I see some factory wiring in there. Jeez, I hope you can see that. <laughs> All this yapping, yeah, okay, you can see it pretty good. We don't need to zoom in on a lot of these things, you know. It's uh, it's general talk here and uh, things to look for. Um, but you're looking for kind of non non stock uh, non stock wiring. So when you go to look at a machine, you should take a little toolkit with you. A lot of these uh, you got to take four screws off to to get at it, and uh, so you want to remove any simple exterior covers so you can take a look at it. You're not going to take the machine apart, but uh, you want to peer under uh, under some of those areas, okay? And uh, um, you know, and if you see oil in there, uh, that's another you know thing uh, that you the machine might have a leak uh, or had a leak at one point uh, or leaked all its oil out and that's where it ended up um, so you'll be you'll be looking at um, uh, in those areas you might you might see a little oil all right so this is rear rear headstock so we got a we got a removable cover here um, and uh, so when I bought this machine I pulled this cover off and took a look in there uh, the main motors in there uh, you get to look at the belts, and I got to look at the uh, the brake mechanism, and uh, and whatever else happens to be in there. Um, and we're not going to open that up now, but that is certainly an area that you would want to uh, take a look at and uh, and peer in there. Now this is an access panel here that uh, is normally accessed. There's some chain. Let's see, yeah. closer there. There's some change gears in here, so I can do metric threading. Uh, and I can swap some gears around. Um, I also get a look at the belts here. Um, and, you know, if it's missing uh, two of the three belts that are supposed to be on there, that's usually probably not a good thing. Uh, and you know that you're going to have to uh, replace some belts. I'm looking for oil, and there's a little bit of oil in here, not too bad. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you're just kind of generally looking. Uh, uh, rounded bolts and things that don't look factory, right? Or don't look, something looks wanky about it. Um, rounded off nuts um, or nuts that don't match or handles that don't match, things like that. So you're just kind of generally surveying every little area uh, and keeping note of the things that aren't um, um, that aren't proper, you know, and you have a um, you know, kind of a, uh, a pluses and minus uh, sheet going, right? Uh, this is a plus, you know, it's got good tooling. Uh, on the bad side, uh, looks like it leaks a little oil. So basically you're, what you're doing is you have a scale and uh, you know, it's one of those scales with two pans on it and you're stacking, you know, good things on one side and bad things on the other. And you know, when you're done looking at it, you look at the scale and you go, hey, I'm in the good or I'm in the bad or it's just barely balancing, right? And um, so you're weighing all these options. Some guys want a project, so they want a beat up old lathe then they're gonna fix it up, right? Um, some guys want a absolutely pristine machine that, they, um, that looks like it just rolled off the showroom floor. Everybody's needs are a little bit different uh, along those lines. Okay, so we've kind of gone over uh, the, the, the main areas. Uh, of the machine. Now I think we, what we want to do is we want to do some power tests here um, and, uh, and see uh, what the machine sounds like. Is it quiet? Is it noisy? Um, how does it sound in forward and reverse? Um, do all the feed change levers work and, uh, and, and different uh, feeds and speeds, do they operate properly? Okay, so um, 
if you can't check the machine under power, you're at a little disadvantage, so you have to look a little closer when you're doing your dry inspection. Um, and it's not the end of the world if you can't run the machine. Um, you know, if you can turn it over, or when you put it in gear and you turn it, you can make things happen, right? So you can just turn it manually and, and, and test some of these things also, okay? Um, if the person doesn't have a phase converter, or it's not wired up, or whatever. But a used machinery guy, they should be able to hook it up and run it. That's a really common request. And if it's in an operating shop, hopefully it's not disconnected and they can, uh, they can run it for you. They may not want you to run it yourself. They may, uh, you know, you may just tell them what you want to see and they'll do it for you. Uh, I like to do it myself, okay? So uh, we're gonna do a power test here. We're gonna go ahead and, uh, and turn the power on. So I hear a click in there. That's usually a good thing, okay? Uh, I want to see what speed I'm in. I want to start in a kind of a slower speed, okay? Um, so looking at the, the levers here, if I'm in high, that's going to be about 500 RPM. So let's, uh, let's do a little less than that. Actually, let's do, let's do that. That should be like 285, all right? And you're just going to kind of stand out of the way. Um, you, and there's a good reason that you don't want to start in a real high speed. Um, you don't know how they mounted the chuck. It might be barely hanging on there on a thread. And uh, um, so you want to start slow and just kind of listen to the machine. Okay. So it fired up. And uh, I'm pretty sure you can, uh, yeah, okay. We can see here our, uh, our lead screws turning, our uh, power feed bars turning. And we get a look. We get a look at this keyway now. Okay, sounds pretty good. Uh, in the lower speeds, typically lanes in the low range, they growl a little bit more um, than they do in the high range. So this one sounds pretty good. So we're gonna try the uh, spindle off, seems to work. Nice coast down. Okay, in that same speed, we're gonna try a reverse. Okay. Seems to work fine. Now, lays in reverse typically are a little noisier, so don't fret if it sounds a little different. That's real common that they sound different. The gear teeth kind of wear on one side, and when you reverse, they just are newer on that side. Um, and tip sometimes there's a, uh, a reversing gear, but uh, this one doesn't have that. Okay. So the next thing I want to test here is the, uh, and let me check the camera and make sure you can kind of see that. Um, I'm going to test the foot brake. Okay, so we're going to fire it up. Okay, and that's what I expect to see. The spindle stops. Okay, and this is still up, by the way. Okay, it stops and the brake pulled it down, uh, pulled the speed down quicker. Now I should be able to reset it by going down and up, okay, seems to work fine, okay, all right, um, okay, so what we're going to do, um, well, we've got some feed engaged here, so we're, let's, we're going to try some feed on the, uh, on the apron here, so you're going to want to, uh, you're going to want to run it you probably don't have to run it in every single speed, okay? Um, but you should go, uh, you should do a few of them. This one's got one, two, three, four, five, 12 speeds from 32 to 1800 RPM. Um, I would run all the, all the common ones where it's been sitting, you know, where people use it a lot. Uh, it's gonna be your, uh, your uh, 200 to 700 range. That's a, that's a very, very uh, useful range. Um, so you're going to try all those speeds typically. Um, and once again, beware of any weird work holding on there because if you fire it up at 2000 RPM and it has a loose chuck jaw, you're going to have a problem, okay? So uh, just be aware that uh, um, you're probably not going to want to run it in, the, in the full speed unless it's got a, a, a tight collet set up in it like this, okay? All right, so we're going to uh, test some uh, power feeding here. All right, lead screw's turning, so we can, uh, uh, we can check the threading lever to start with. 
Okay. It engaged smoothly. Seems to be. It should disengage instantaneously when we come out, which it does. And uh, then we're going to try our longitudinal feed. Okay. And what I do is I, is I lean on this a little bit, like it's got a load on it. So I pull a little bit on that, and I shouldn't be able to stop it. Okay, it shouldn't slip or kick out. Okay, and then uh, try the cross feed. Same thing, you know, lean on it a little bit. Not hard, but you know, I'm putting a little pressure on it. Okay, that seems to be operating fine. And this shifts smoothly between the two. Oh, up the Okay. All right. Now I'm gonna um, I'm gonna increase the feed rate. Basically, I'm doubling it right now. Now you see the lead screw and uh, and feed screw are rotating a lot faster. So we're gonna try that again. And you're going to want to shift the gearbox and try a few uh, a few feed ranges there. Okay. The next thing to test, and uh, let me swing over here again. All right. We're going to reverse the feed direction. Okay. That's typically your farthest left lever on almost all lays. Okay. So this changes the direction um, of the lead screw. Okay. It's feeding the opposite direction. Okay, and this is feeding in. So that's called the feed change lever. You want to make sure that's a really important lever on a, on a, on a lathe. That one needs to work. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see, that's about it at the uh, on the apron there. Uh, we talked about running them to their. You, you don't want to run them at, to their extreme travels under power. Um, you'll do that manually and then just kind of examine the, uh, the way surfaces and uh, uh, see if there's anything amiss there. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the rear, uh, uh, the tailstock area here. Um, and we have another removable cover here and you would want to pull that off. And um, so there's some uh, coolant pump um, accessories and electrical uh, in that area. You want to take a look at that. Um, this lathe has a coolant pump, so if the lathe that you're inspecting has a coolant pump, um, you, you probably want to try it, um, but only enough to, that you can hear the pump running. Um, I wouldn't necessarily spew coolant out. Um, some people don't run it very often and whatever coolant they have in it is pretty nasty. It's more like a septic tank than a coolant sump, okay? So you would, you would turn it on and listen, and if you hear the pump, good, the electrics work. Um, yeah, you can put new impellers in them and, uh, and work on the pumps if you need to, um, but you're gonna wanna uh, thoroughly clean the machine so you know what's in it and uh, um, you know the, <laughs> what hazardous waste is in it and uh, that you have to deal with, okay? So once again, any, any easily removable access covers, you're gonna wanna pull those off, inspect inside, you're gonna look for uh, uh, like stray leaking oil that doesn't uh, uh, look like it belongs there. Um, any um, uh, bozoed electrics uh, or homegrown electrics, um, things like that. Okay. Okay. So one thing uh, at this end here. So um, it's it's one thing to look at a lathe. It's another thing to actually buy it. Um, so if you're not buying it on the spot. Um, take as you know. Take pictures of these things too as you're working your way through it, because uh, your your pictures are better than your memory. Um, you're going to want to note the uh, the make and model and the size, and uh, typically, and and this is true on this lathe also. The serial number is stamped in the uh, in the ways here, and you compare that with the name tag. Make sure it's the same number. Um, it's kind of like uh, Volkswagens, right? You know, check the VIN numbers, right? Um, anyway, uh, so note those numbers. There's tons of information available on the web. Uh, a lot of guys have databases about different machines. So you can, um, 
uh, get some some really good information on the web about uh, vintage uh, parts availability things like that so if you're looking at the machine and it looks like it needs a lot of parts and stuff like that um, you know you're gonna want to do a little bit of research and uh, and see uh, what you're getting into uh, um, if you need to buy any parts or uh, um, um, accessories or you're gonna need any help with it um, but the, res uh, the internet's a great resource for for uh, machinery um, so that's that's that little item okay so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, is uh, tooling for the machine um, tooling's a big deal and um, so you know you want to figure out what's come what comes with the machine some machines people want to sell them stripped down because uh, they have multiple machines and they want to save the tooling for another one of the machine other people just want to get the thing out of there and everything that goes with it so uh, if you're buying a machine hopefully you're bumping into one of these guys that just wants to get rid of all this all the stuff that goes with it so you know these are a hundred bucks a pop okay these holders um, you know this is this is a C size here you know this is seven hundred dollars new something like that just for that block uh, and these are around a hundred you know eighty to a hundred dollars a piece uh, big Jacobs drill uh, um, that's a three hundred dollar drill chuck okay so you can see pop 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 the tooling adds up really quickly so 5c collar closer okay uh, this one's a royal here uh, the closer part of it is uh, seven or eight hundred bucks the spindle nose is another three hundred and collets are you know anywhere from seven to forty bucks a piece right um, oh yeah while we're, while we're in this chuck area um, so this particular lathe here uh, has a uh, what they call a cam lock spindle okay it has a stud that projects into these holes and then it has a little cam device here that locks and pulls the chuck back into this area so uh, one thing to look at is if you can see them um, is to look at these holes um, lathes that uh, have been abused uh, this area is kind of beat up um, and uh, uh, if the chuck is small and it's easily dismountable, I might be tempted to take it off. Um, if there were, if it, you thought it was questionable, if the rest of the lathe was leading you to believe that uh, there might be some problem there, uh, I would want to take this stuff off and look at the internal taper in there in that area. And in particular, this mounting taper here, you want to run your hand around that and it should be nice and smooth and, uh, um, and clean. Um, and once again, these, these uh, cam lock holes. Uh, some lathes have threaded, um, threaded spindle attachments. So uh, you know, you're going to look at us, look at those threads, make sure they're not all chewed up. And um, they have a, um, an internal, uh, see what's the L? Uh, the L is a internal taper. Yeah, it's an internal taper with a key in it. And uh, if you're not careful when you mount those L uh, tapers, uh, the key uh, chowders up the uh, that internal taper so if somebody's slamming the chuck on there and then trying to find the keyway uh, it kind of tends to beat that uh, area up in there and that's a uh, what an L spindle mount and those are uh, a little different because they have a uh, um, a ring here uh, that has spanner notches in it so it's a thick the ring is stays on the machine and it rotates and it has a thread Oh no, the, yeah, the L has a, yeah, it's a taper, I'm sorry. Um, and then inside the chuck uh, is what gets beat up. I'm, I had that backwards. Um, we have an L spindle at work, and uh, anyway, I got it backwards. But there'll be a taper here and a key. The inside of the chuck tends to get beat up, but the chuck also beats up the, the end of the spindle a little bit because, you know, they're heavy, and you're trying to shove them on there, and they're bonking around, or maybe it's hanging from the crane and swinging, you know, and banging into that. So that's an area that gets kind of beat up there too. Um, so take a look at that. Uh, and then here, you know, run your finger under here. You're looking for, for uh, you know, wet oil coming out of this area here. There's a big seal in here because uh, this thing's got a bunch of oil in it and oil is fed to these main bearings here. So this is an area that uh, a lot of lays will have an oil leak. Once again, it's not the end of the world if there's an oil leak. Uh, you know, oil's pretty cheap, and uh, you know sometimes bust. You think buying a lathe is uh, is complicated? Take one apart and put it back together, and uh, so 
you know, if it's got a little oil leak, maybe you just leave it. Uh, or maybe not. Depends how ambitious you are. Um, yeah, so the tooling, uh, there's, uh, there's face plates, there's steady rests, there's follow rests. Um, anything that's got the, uh, the same color paint on it that's in the area of the lathe or, or nearby in the shop, you're going to want to ask questions about it. Um, if it looks like it might go on the machine, ask the question. And um, um, like I said, if it's painted the same color, <laughs> definitely ask. Because uh, if you got a lathe and it didn't have a, um, a steady rest and you decided that you needed one, you're going to either make one uh, or try to find one on the internet and uh, you know it's a whole nother uh, a whole nother can of worms to open up so you know tooling that belongs to that machine should stay with that machine uh, in general uh, a seller wouldn't charge you extra for what I would call stock tooling they might charge you for things like tool posts and drill chucks but a, a steady rest or a follow rest uh, uh, or a face plate, uh, no, they shouldn't be, uh, those shouldn't be adders. Um, additional chucks, potentially, yeah. So if you can get multiple chucks, that's great. Four jaw, three jaw, six jaw, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, always, a, always a bonus. And um, I don't generally inspect the tooling too closely, you know, I just take a quick look at it, make sure it, it belongs with the lathe and, uh, uh, and just make sure it gets with the machine uh, uh, when you're ready to move it. And that's what we'll talk about next is, uh, is so you bought a lathe now, what do you do? You gotta move the damn thing, right? Well, these things are, um, can be tricky to move. So we'll talk a little just briefly about uh, ways of doing that uh, uh, for people that are not familiar with moving uh, kind of heavy things, okay? So we're gonna talk about that in a sec. Okay, so we talked about, uh, you know, how to look at some of the things to look for when you're looking at lathes. Uh, uh, some of the things to try and how you try them and the, the kind of the, uh, the features and the faults that you're looking for. Um, so great, you make the deal. You, you weasel the guy and you, you get a thousand bucks knocked off of it and you, you give the guy a bunch of money and now you got to move it. Okay, so you got a couple of choices. You can hire a professional, which um, in general is recommended. Um, they're expensive because they take some big risks moving equipment around. Um, if your potential move is uh, dicey, up and down stairs, things like that, uh, it takes a lot of planning and a lot of uh, uh, experience to, uh, to do that. So if you've never moved anything heavy, then uh, um, the, this caliber of heavy, I should say. Um, it, you know, hiring a professional or uh, coercing a, uh, an experienced friend is, uh, is probably your best bet. Um, if you uh, uh, are interested in trying, though, it's totally doable. Okay, so uh, and here's here's some uh, some pointers from Tom on uh, on moving uh, machinery like this. Now, this is a pretty big lathe here. This thing weighs uh, um, what's it weigh? It weighs uh, twenty. 300 or 2400 kilograms okay so it's almost it's like 5,000 pounds okay it's it's a pretty heavy machine and typically lays are heaviest towards the headstock lightest towards towards the tailstock uh, one thing you can do to balance things sometimes is you can move the tailstock and the headstock around um, so the first thing is um, um, you know how do I move it right well um, my personal favorite actually is uh, to use a pallet jack. Um, pallet jacks are uh, they're pretty cheap. Um, if you don't have one, uh, you can probably buy one off Craigslist for a hundred bucks. You can rent them. And uh, I'm going to wheel one in right now. And uh, you got a lot of control with these things, okay? Now, you notice it went under there, okay? Um, now I raised this lathe up because uh, the ergonomics of this, it was a little too low, so I wanted to raise it up uh, so I could have a, a, a non-concrete surface to stand on, but that's kind of another story there. Uh, but I made sure that I raised it enough that I can just slide the pallet jack right underneath it, okay? Uh, this pallet jack has a 5,500 pound capacity, which is pretty normal for, uh, for these. Um, and you can usually find a spot in here where the whole thing kind of balances nicely. Uh, and now you've got hydraulic control, you can lift it up. 
um, and these things uh, um, can uh, steer around uh, pretty, pretty uh, um, dynamically. Um, sometimes you can use two pallet jacks, one on either end, one on the heavy end, one on the light end, and a couple of guys. Um, and, uh, and depending on how you can access the machine, so you know each machine in each situation is different. So I'm just going to give some general ideas about uh, how you can move machines. So if you're if you're into buying machines or you want to buy machines, a pallet jack is a really good investment, and uh, you can use it for all kinds of stuff. I move my welding table and my anvil and and you know, all kinds of heavy stuff around because I'm getting old and weak. Okay, so I need leverage. So but if the lathe's down on the floor, you got to start by lifting the lathe up. Okay, that's the uh, really the first thing, and uh, bringing it up uh, enough to get a pallet jack under it. So to get a pallet jack under something here, um, you need to come up about three inches. Okay, and uh, so the uh, the method that I like, um, you know. It's kind of the Egyptian method. So I use uh, pry bars and blocks, um, and you lift each side up a little bit, a little bit, and you work your way around, and you and you bring it up as level as you can. Okay. And actually, you know what? I'm going to shift the camera around and bring you in a little closer and show you how uh, how you position the blocks and uh, and do all that stuff. Okay. So let's let's pretend that this is very important too. Uh, to kneel on because uh, when you're moving machinery uh, you're on your knees quite a bit. So um, um, if you're going to go move a machine you're going to need a large selection uh, like two two milk crates full of uh, blocks and little pieces of plywood of different shapes and sizes two by fours plywood and some four by fours and then um, my personal my personal favorite are the wedge blocks. So you can see here from moving milling machines here there's marks in these and what this does is this is like an infinitely adjustable block. So if I get my uh, oops there it is. So if I get my pry bar under here right for example say I'm like this and I got my pry bar under here and I lift it up I can just poke the tip of that in there and I can come up a little bit, reshift these blocks, come up a little more, and I just keep bopping that in there. And you know, you have four of these, and you just work your way around the machine, and pretty soon you're you're up there, okay? And that's enough to get the pallet jack under, okay? So all you need is a few blocks to to work the uh, the pry bar against, okay? And uh, and then four of these or six of these, something like that. You know, and this is a 12 or 16 inch piece of 4x4 uh, that's just been split. Okay. It's just been split like that. And uh, let's see, I even put my initials on there so I don't lose them. And um, um, that's the, the greatest invention known to man. Um, this is my favorite pry bar here. It's an adjustable head one. I think I've talked about this one before. Um, it's expensive but worth it. But Almost any pry bar will work, um, and um, you know you need a you need a two or three footer to to do an average machine uh, with an average person. Longer is better, but sometimes uh, tight spaces uh, get in your way. So anyway, you start in one corner, put some blocks under there, get your bar under there, and. Well, and maybe you're starting right on the concrete, so you get it up a little bit, shove the wedge in, and then pretty soon you're up on blocks like this. And, uh, and once again, the, the goal is to keep the machine as level as possible while you're bringing it up high enough to get the, uh, the pallet jack under. And then once you get the pallet jack under, now you're, it's pretty easy to move the machine around. You know, there'll be a lot of inertia because the machine's heavy, but uh, um, you can move it around. Now, if there's any driveways or any slopes, you're going to want to tie the machine off to something sturdy so that you have, a, you have a, some kind of break. Um, if you're going down a steep driveway, um, my, heart, my heart feels for you. That's a, that's a tough one. Uh, but you're going to want to use a come-along or a, um, 
uh, a winch or a pulley system so that you have some ability to break the machine. Uh, if these things get moving, uh, you can't stop them. They'll stop when they, uh, they hit the bottom of the hill. So, uh, so anyway, there's the wedges, there's that. So now I'll show you a, uh, uh, another method for uh, moving a machine that's in a tighter space, perhaps. Okay, so um, let's. Uh, this is a an alternate method here, and uh, let's say this this machine uh, um, is in a in a tight space in the shop, and uh, we got to get it out where we can get at it with a pallet jack or a forklift or something like that. Um, so um, one way you can do that, and, and these are easy to make. Um, so I got some heavy angle here. And uh, these are uh, wheels off a of pallet jack. You can get these off McMaster. They're, you know, anywhere from 18 to 30 dollars, something like that. And they got bearings in them and everything. And you can weld these up. And what we're going to do with these, um, and then it's got these guys underneath. So using the same techniques, you're going to raise the machine up, and then these are going to sit under the heavy end, kind of like that, one on each side. And then connecting those, connecting those two, uh, these two rear rollers together is uh, two all threads that run across the machines, and you nut and then you tension those. So now these are these are firmly clamped to the machine. I suppose you could even use bar clamps or something like that, but I think they get in the way. So I just use all threads going across there. And um, uh, so now you've got two heavy-duty wheels tight into the machine here under the heavy end and then what I did and you know on a smaller machine um, you could probably use a, uh, a pallet jack or even a sturdy skateboard or a, um, um, a furniture dolly or something like that this machine's pretty heavy on the other end so I made some little uh, ball bearing dollies and I added this leveling foot on it so that uh, um, you know as the machine kind of goes over bumpy ground it compensates for that. So you also notice that this is kind of a three point system and that's the best way to move equipment is if you can arrange a three point system because you go across this concrete and there's some unevenness and if you you hit a low spot and you have a four-point system, a lot of times one of your little skates will come wheeling out on its own because it's not under any load. And then suddenly then you're in a, a condition where uh, you can uh, um, load that corner in the next couple of feet or something and then you got your machine tipping. So with a three-point system, uh, all three points stay on the ground. It's the three-legged stool principle. And uh, so uh, generally favorable to do that, but you're going to want your two points on the heavy end and your um, and this is also the steering end here, too. So this is free to turn and I put a pipe on this and I can push that around and now I can drive this lathe than anywhere I want in the shop. And once again, this is a, you know, this is an afternoon uh, little fab job in the shop. Um, you know, making up a, a couple of these little dollies. So uh, if you're anticipating moving a machine, you can do this. Um, if you don't have time to do this, then you can do the pallet jack or the two pallet jack thing. Uh, and it's a good, safe way to, uh, to move a machine, okay? So anyway, that's some pointers for uh, moving the machines. You know, we saw the, uh, uh, the wood 4x4 four four wedges um, and all that. All right, so we talked about a lot of stuff here. Um, and uh, this will be on YouTube and you can uh, refer back to it anytime. And you know, the most important thing is uh, with any of this stuff is just go slow and um, um, you know, observe, right? Use your eyes and your, uh, your senses to evaluate the equipment. And then if you have to move it, uh, you're going to want to operate very, very slowly and very carefully and deliberately. Uh, you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to hurt your machine. Um, and um, so um, um, just take it slow. It doesn't matter if it takes all day or even a couple of days, okay? Uh, better than dropping a machine in the parking lot or, uh, uh, or having to fly off your truck and, uh, or trailer or whatever. 
um, the um, um, it, it's all doable. You know, we're humans are uh, are inherently weak animals, so we use leverage and we use our brains to get around uh, our our weaknesses. So uh, if you keep that in mind while you're moving these kinds of things, then uh, uh, you'll be fine. Okay, so uh, you know. Old guys with uh, um, sticks and oxen uh, build pyramids, right? I guess, uh, you know, they haul these multi-ton blocks uh, uphill. And uh, sure, I'm sure a couple of them got squished. But, uh, um, um, you know, it just goes to show that uh, if you use your brains, there's all kinds of things you can do. And uh, um, anyway, so that's kind of it um, for this video. And uh I hope you guys liked it. Uh, I kind of had fun doing it, and I, I wanted to do something like this. And um, um, if there's something I didn't talk about, uh, uh, shoot a shoot a comment out, and uh, I'll try to get it answered for you. And uh, you know, none of this stuff is scripted. This is all just you know coming out of my head, right? Uh, I look at the machine and I think about it, and I and I start talking, and uh, so. Uh, it'd be pretty easy for me to miss something, okay? Um, and uh, I'm happy to help if, uh, uh, if you put a comment up, okay? And uh, anyway, that's about it. Uh, hope you guys go out and find your own nice equipment and, uh, uh, and feel more confident about looking at it and evaluating it and then potentially moving it yourself. Uh, this is a pretty big moving project. A small lathe is pretty easy to do, actually, compared to this. And you invest in a little tooling and uh, and a good crate full of blocks. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's just do that. So, you see those boxes of blocks? That's what you need to show up at the job with. Okay, uh, a couple of mill crates full of blocks, and uh, um, you know, a shopping bag full of blocks is not gonna not not gonna get it done. Okay, anyway, thanks for watching, uh, have fun and be safe.